You fan of Dragonlance? Uh, I know a lot of people are. I personally never read any of the novels, it just wasn't in my wheelhouse, but that's not, or I guess it wasn't growing up. Obviously now D&D is my wheelhouse, so I, maybe I should. Anyway, long story short, I have some bad news for you, apparently, uh, if you're a fan of Dragonlance, and I just found out about this a little bit ago, so a big shout out to Lex from Dank Dungeons, who plays with me on our streams on Wednesday night for Rata 7 Parts, who brought this to my attention. Take a look at this. Fantasy writers Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman of Dragonlance fame have sued D&D publisher Wizards of the Coast. Complicated allegations, but the gist is they were writing a new Dragonlance trilogy, and Watsy said it would not approve further drafts, quote, no reason was provided. This is from today, the 19th of October at 1019 a.m. And it says down here, Weiss and Hickman's complaint references, rewrites, uh, following controversies around Watsy, re-cultural insensitivity slash bias in content and corporate culture. If anyone has more information, my DMs are open. This was from uh, Cecilia from, looks like she's a writer for Wired and formerly from Kotaku. Um, so yeah, let's see. Their, their complaint references rewrite, rewrites following controversies around Watsy. So cultural insensitivity slash bias in content and corporate culture. So if we click this scribbed here article, we can see this was filed on the 16th of October. Uh, complaint for breach of contract, breach of implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing. And I guess that's tortious. I never heard that word before. Interference with contract jury demand. So are among the most widely read and most... Uh, and successful living authors and world creators in the fantasy fiction area. Over 35 years ago, plaintiff creators conceived of and created the Dragonlance Universe, a, a campaign setting for D&D, the rights to which are owned by a defendant. In D&D, uh, gamers assume... Oh, so they really go that into it, huh? Gamers assume a role with the storyline and embark on a series of adventures, a campaign in the context of a particular campaign setting. Plaintiff creators, uh, again, I am not a lawyer. I have no knowledge of legal. I'm just reading this as an everyman. If you are more versed in, in legal speak and have that kind of information, please leave a thought, you know, let me know in the comments or hit me up on some other form of social media and let me know and I can make a follow-up video to this. Um, development of the Dragonlance universe has given rise to, among other things, blah, 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 video games and so on, while other authors have been invited to participate in creating over 190 separate fictional works within the Dragonlance universe, often with plaintiff creators as editors. Weiss and Hickman's own works remain by far the most familiar and saleable. Saleable? Saleable. It's probably saleable. That makes the most sense. Uh, their work was inspired generations of gamers. I'm still, like, I didn't realize that when you put together, like, one of these contracts, you, like, you talk yourself up like this. I really, I'm just unaware of any of this, so... Um, mm -hmm, World of Kryn and so on are in around 2017. Plaintiff creators learned that the defendant was receptive to licensing its properties with established authors to revitalize the D&D brand. This kind of makes sense. This is actually a little bit after uh, the release of 5th edition. So this is two years into 5th edition cycle. After a 10-year hiatus, plaintiff creators approached defendant and began negotiating for a license to author a new Dragonlance trilogy. Plaintiff creators viewed the new trilogy as the capstone, wow, the capstone to their life's work and as an offering to their multitude of fans who had clamored for a continuation of the series. Given that Dragonlance series intellectual property is owned by the defendant, there could be no publication without a license. In March 2019, so just last year, the negotiations between parties hereto culminated in a new written licensing agreement, whereby Weiss and Hickman were to personally author and publish a new Dragonlance trilogy in conjunction with Penguin Random House, a highly prestigious book publisher. We know Penguin Random House if you if you know books, so that makes sense. So this is, just to clarify, this is a set of novels, folks, not a D&D &D book, but it looks like they reached an agreement in March 2019, which more often than not would mean it seems like there's the potential. I got light in my face here. Uh, that's what happens when I make videos actually during the day. Um you know, that there might actually be a Dragonlance campaign setting. If they're going to release new novels associated with it, it would only make sense to release, start releasing a new trilogy and then release a campaign setting alongside it. Okay. 
By the time the license agreement was signed, Defendant had a full overview of the story and story arc with considerable detail of the planned trilogy. Defendant knew exactly the nature of the work he was going to receive and had pre-approved Penguin Random House as the publisher. Indeed, Defendant was at all times aware of the contract between Penguin Random House and Plaintiff Creators and its terms. In fact, the license agreement expressly refers to the publishing agreement. So June of 2019, Defendant received and approved a full outline of the first contracted book in the trilogy, quote, Book One. And by November of last year, the publisher accepted a manuscript for Book One. Plaintiff creators in turn sent the Book One manuscript to the Defendant, who approved it in January of this year. In the meantime, Defendant was already approving foreign translation rights and encouraging plaintiff creators to work on subsequent novels. Well, that, in theory, is a good thing. During the development and writing process, plaintiff creators met all contractual milestones and received all requisite approvals from the defendant. Defendant at all time knew that Hickman and Weiss had devoted their full attention and time commitment to completing book one and the trilogy as a whole in conformity with their contractual obligations. During this writing process, they proposed certain changes in keeping with the modern day zeitgeist of a more inclusive and diverse story world. At each step, plaintiff creators timely accommodated such requests and all others within the framework of their novels. This collaborative process tracks with section blah, 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 the license agreement, defended to approve plaintiff creator's drafts uh, on or about August 13th, 2020. So just two months ago, uh, defendant participated in a telephone conference with plaintiff creator's agents, which was attended by defendant's highest level executives and attorneys, as well as PRH executives and counsel. I don't know what PRH means, but. Uh, at that meeting, defendant declared that it would not approve any further drafts of book one or any subsequent workings in the trilogy, effectively repudiating and terminating the license agreement. No reason was given for the termination. In any event, no material breaches or defaults were indi uh, indicated or exists, uh, existed upon which to predicate a termination. The termination was wholly arbitrary and without contractual basis. That's that's not good. The termination was unlawful and in violation of multiple aspects of the license agreement, arguably almost every part of it. In fact, that seems like a little, that doesn't seem like legal writing, but all right. Termination also had the knowing and premediated effect of precluding publication and destroying the value of plaintiff creators' work, not to mention their publishing deal with Penguin Random House. Defendants' acts and failures to act breached the license agreement and were made in stunning and brazen bad faith. Defendant acted with full knowledge that its unilateral decision would not only interfere with, but also lay waste to the years of work the plaintiff creators had, to that point, put into the project. Given that the obligation to obtain a publisher was part and parcel of the license agreement, defendant was fully cognizant that its backdoor termination of the license agreement would nullify the millions of dollars in remuneration to which plaintiff creators were titled from publishing contract. Oof. This does not paint Watsi in a good light. As plaintiff creators subsequently learned, defendant's arbitrary decision to terminate the license agreement and thereby the publishing of the book was based on events that had nothing to do with either the work or plaintiff creators. In fact, at nearly the exact point in time of termination, defendant was embroiled in a series of embarrassing published public disputes whereby its non-Dragonlance publications were... Uh, exoriated for racism and sexism. Moreover, the company itself was vilified by well-public allegations of misogyny and racist hiring and employment practices by and with respect to artists and employees unrelated to Dragonlands. Plaintiff creators are informed and believe and based thereon allege that a decision was made jointly by defendant and its parent company Hasbro Inc. to deflect any possible criticism or further publication outcry regarding defendant's other properties by effectively killing the Dragonlance deal with plaintiff creators. The upshot of that was to inflict knowing malicious and oppressive harm to plaintiff creators and to interfere with their third party contractual obligations. So basically what it sounds like here is amidst all of the uh, kind of shit that Wizards of the Coast was going through and is still kind of going through regarding um, insensitivity, whether it be in the published books or what's going on, their whole thing that they've had going on with who they've worked with, who they've fired, who they've wrongfully handled uh, as far as whether they be freelance, internal, and so on, which is basically what it sounds like here, right? Uh, embarrassing public disputes, uh, and then well-publicized allegations of misogyny and racist hiring and so on. So amidst all that, that was, what was that, July? Earlier this year, I think? Um, I, COVID, right? Can't keep track of time. I think that was early. I think that, that was this year, though. That was like the May to July timeframe, I believe, of this year. 
And they're saying that it sounds like based on that, as like almost, I don't know if it's a knee jerk reaction or not. Hasbro was just like, let's kill Dragonlance. So what I'm reading here again, far be it for me to say that I have any knowledge of legal counsel or how any of this has worked. This is just what I'm reading. I will absolutely link this in the description if you would like to check this out. Um, court has jurisdiction pursuant, blah, blah, blah. Diversity of citizenship between the parties and the, uh, executive costs. The sum of $75,000 uh, as a citizen of, say, Wisconsin. Court also jurisdiction over the subject matter of this action, declaratory relief. So it sounds like they're asking for $75,000 is what I'm gathering, gathering from that. Um, let's see. Margaret Weiss LLC is a Wisconsin limited life. Plaintiff Tracy Hickman is an individual, is a renowned best-selling author. Defendant Wizards of the Coast LLC. Two of the most widely beloved, blah, blah, blah. Defendant acquired the D&D brand from failing entity known as TSR. As a result of plaintiff creators' contributions, defendant staged a dramatic resurgence of the D&D brand. Based on this resurgence in 1999, defendant was acquired by and is now a subsidiary of Hasbro. Uh, Hasbro is publicly traded for $5 billion on or about August. Okay, so this is more of the timeline. Facts and averments common to all causes of action is what this says. So I think this is just corroborating or reiterating what we just read through, right? 2017, they had the licensing agreement. They started to do the work on it. Defendant was specifically aware that PRH contact a contract provided. Oh, Pangdom Random House, that's PRH. Providing a minimum advance to plaintiff creators for all three works with significant additional financial incentives. Indeed, with additional performance bonuses, royalties, and ancillary incomes, and given the pent-up demand for new works by plaintiff creators, Penguin Random House deal was worth in excess of $10 million to the plaintiff creators. As part of the negotiations with defendant and Penguin Random House, had to show their work concepts, storylines, and so on. In short, defendant was fully apprised of the scope, nature, and content of the trilogy and agreed to go forward with the grant of license on that basis. On or about February 2019, Penguin Random House and the defendant uh, entered into a side agreement that was essentially a building block for the final license agreement. In that side agreement, defendant not only specifically acknowledged Penguin Random House's pivotal role in the licensing agreement with the plaintiff creators, but also expressly made clear that the license was going to be conveyed in toto to plaintiff creators with only a few stipulations as to the ownership of the underlying intellectual property to D&D and Dragonlance, the very limited approval and consultation rights reserved to the defendant, all of which related to the marketing of the books, book jacket art, press releases, advertising copies, and so on. Each of the parties, including third party, recognized that in the context of producing the trilogy, a license or licensing agreement that could be retracted arbitrarily at the whim of the defendant would be illusory and ineffective. In any case, it would hardly be the basis for either the plaintiff creators or the publisher to move forward with the transaction. To the contrary, the whole point of the contemplated set of agreements was to give all parties assurances that the license was in place and contractual predicates uh, were set in stone so the project could be completed. Um, negotiations were completed in March. For the licensing agreement, defendant transferred rights to uh, Dungeons & Dragons brand expressly for the writing marketing purpose of the plaintiff creators. June approved the detail outline of the book. January Hasbro Group uh, specified approval for book one. A uh, book one was provisionally identified on named Dragons of Deceit. By late 2019, plaintiff creators had also completed substantial work on the book two manuscript. Sounds like they were really doing the work and it sounds like it was almost getting ready for release. December 2019, negotiated a German translation for the book. Um, in a June 2020, defendant changed the editorial and oversight team assigned to the new Dragonlance trilogy, removing Liz Shu and Hilary Ross, replacing them with Nick Kelman and Paul Morrissey. Mr. Kelman, who was and remains defendant's head of story and entertainment, was a controversial choice. Oh boy. As recently as 2019, his own publication as author of the sexually explicit novel Girls a Peon? Peon? was subject to ongoing public discussions of whether his work contained or promoted misogyny and pedophilia. Oof. Uh, it self-contains trigger warnings and implied sexual abuse and statutory rape. Guys. Following Mr. Kelman's assignment to the Defendant's Dragonlance team, Defendant issued a four-point set of comments dealing with various sensitivity issues ranging from the use of love potions in the story 
as referenced in the 5e Dungeon Master's Guide to the Concerns of Sexism, Inclusivity, and Potential Negative Connotations of Certain Character Names. On each occasion when the publisher or defendant directly or indirectly express reservations about the text or require, uh, requested rewrites, including sensitivity writers, plaintiff creators accommodated such requests and provided rewrites, in one case 70 pages worth. Regardless, at no point in time was there any indication of any problem with the writing or rewriting process. In fact, given the process was moving forward, plaintiffs also informed defendant that they had completed book two of the trilogy, provisionally titled Dragons of Fate. By early mid to 2020, uh, particularly in the July timeframe, this kind of corroborates what I was saying. Uh, separate from Dragonlance, defendant was engulfed in controversy. Specifically, defendant was subject to drumbeat of negative publicity related to alleged pervasive racism and various forms of cultural sensitivity slash offensiveness in connection with its Magic the Gathering trading cards, as well as its professional hiring and advancement processes within the company. In particular, beyond the issue of Mr. Kelman, who remained controversial, the hiring of alleged white supremacist alt-right QAnon affiliated story artist Therese Nielsen, I didn't even know about this, was targeted by defendants' detractors, was alleged over-sexualizing of the work by content creator Elizabeth Eden. Further, certain allegations made against defendant by the defendant's former employee, Ryan Black, this is what we're familiar with, uh, a self-described non-binary black person became a media sensation. As a result, defendant issued a public apology, which in turn only fanned the flames of consumer slash Twitter slash internet blowback against defendant all the more. On information and belief, the aforementioned controversies came to attention of and were addressed at the highest levels by defendant's parent company, Hasbro. Plaintiff creators ultimately discovered that at the same time defendant was under public siege, defendant was interacting and communicating directly with Pen Penguin Random House on editorial topics related to book one and the trilogy with the intent of actively interfering with plaintiff creators' business relationships. On or about August 13th, acting with the knowledge and consent possibly at the direction of Hasbro, defendant held a telephonic conference with plaintiff creators and their representatives. Among those present were Messrs. Kelman and Morrissey, defendants' in-house lawyers, Nick Mitchell and Bell and Hellerstein, various public, public, oh my God, Penguin Random House representatives, including executives and counsel. At the telephonic meeting, without any forewarning, defendant's attorney, Mr. Mitchell, stated defendant refused to perform under the license agreement, effectively terminating the agreement unilaterally. When challenged about the grounds for such termination, Mitchell responded with the nonsensical statement, we are not moving forward, we are not moving toward breach, but we will not, we are not moving toward breach, but we will not approve any further drafts. Defendant's statements and conduct were stunningly bad faith ever, yeah, I'll say so, by expressly withdrawing its further, uh, let's see, terminating plaintiff's ability to work, destroyed plaintiff's ability to mitigate or modify their storylines, knowing interfere with plaintiff's contract with Penguin Random House. Uh, as we were subject to proof of trial, defendant's acts were not privileged under the license agreement. First claim of, for relief. So I'm not going to read through too much more of this. I've already read through it for about 18 minutes. But... <laughs> what? This just looks like... I mean, you know... So first of all, we knew that now we learned that they were working on Dragonlance. Two books were basically complete. And then I, it seems like it's a reaction to what Watsy had going on with all of the things stated there. And possibly there was more listed in there that I didn't even get to. Uh... And they just, like, flat out were like, nope, we're done, no reason, goodbye, end of story. Uh, and it just sounds like it's just bad. And, like, obviously this stuff is going to get out. It's on the internet. I found it, right? So anybody could find this. But I feel like no one's talking about this. So I wanted to make a video on it um, because I do news coverage, right, for D&D. &D, and this is clearly news to me, and I'm sure it's news to all of you as well. Uh, again, please, if you're someone who understands uh, legal speak and is a lawyer or, you know, law student or anyone who gets better understanding of this and you're able to read through this, I read through about 15 of the 21 pages. I don't know if there's much more beyond that, but it doesn't look good. And like the fact that you had a licensing agreement in place and then you flat out are just like, no, we're done. I, I don't know. I, I Is this something that like a big company like Hasbro might just do and like oh, well, that sucks, we'll pay the fine and, like, just move on rather than, like, try to, you know, renegotiate or better yet provide grounds on why you're canceling this? I, I don't know. 
I don't know. It's very interesting uh, and super unfortunate. Uh, I don't know. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I'll see you all next time.